Irish Dog Solidarity Conference Panel. We have from dogs, and we need to march, be in solidarity with those who are legitimate um, service dog handlers. And there is a lot of misunderstanding and fear of the psychiatric dog movement, and is it fraud, is it whatever. And what I'm gonna tell you is the people that are gonna speak to you today will show you how legitimate, trained dogs help people with psychiatric disabilities. And before I turn the microphone over to our panel moderator this afternoon, Janine Stanley, um, I do wanna take a moment of personal privilege and thank the wonderful people who accepted my invitation to come and make themselves vulnerable to you and, and show you how their dogs help you. You all know Tony Eames very well. You remember her um, late husband, Ed. And I do wanna say on a personal note that <laughs> we, we worked with, with the organization that I'm sure Tony's gonna talk about, um, IAADP, um, the International, <coughs> excuse me, the International Association of Assistance Dog Partners. Well, that would be immortalized on the tape. <laughs> and, um, and, my, and, some, and some people that I am beginning to consider friends, Brad and Veronica Morris, and they will talk to you, but Veronica has got the most adorable psychiatric service dog, and she's gonna talk to you about Hestia. And um, Janine is our expert, and um, so, and Tony has invited a colleague, so we have a wonderful group of experts. And what I would ask of you is to please listen with open minds and open hearts that we can learn about this service that these dogs provide, and that we, we can learn that they are as much against fraudulent service dog business as we are. So this is an opportunity for us to learn and to make new friends in the service dog movement. So without any further ado from me, um, I'm gonna turn this over to our panel moderator, Janine Stanley, whom you have heard from earlier today. And she is going to lead the panel discussion, introduce our panelists, and so take it away, Miss Janine. Here's the mic. Whoopsie, got it. All right. Thanks, everybody. Thank you all for coming back from lunch. If you went outside at lunchtime, it is gorgeous out there. Uh, and for those of us who are wondering about our flights being canceled, don't go outside because you'll just want to stay. It won't matter. It's beautiful out there, folks. My flight has been canceled. I did it. All right. All right. Well, um, so we are going to talk other types of service dogs today. And we're going to talk about them because the Americans with Disabilities Act definition of a service animal is any animal, dog actually now, as of the uh, 2010 revisions, any dog specially trained to do a task, and, and if you're, pardon me, I'm going to, I'm going to paraphrase here, but uh, specially trained to do work or perform tasks to mitigate someone's disability. Now, the big part there is specially trained, and then there are other parts of the definition that talk about public behavior, and there's a lot of guidance from the Department of Justice about public behavior, but we're talking dogs, and we're talking all kinds of dogs. We're also talking all kinds of disabilities, and we're gonna hear a little bit about that today. <laughs> and I will warn you, you may hear some things here you may find controversial. You may hear some things here you don't like. You may hear a lot of things you're gonna agree with. And we hope you will hear a lot of things here that will make you think. Now, I'm gonna describe my attire today for a reason, um, which will become evident later. But um, <laughs> I am actually wearing a black and white long cardigan, black pants, white shirt, and a lovely distinctive green scarf. And we will learn the meaning of that later, but let me introduce my panelists here. So to my left, I have Tony Ames, and Tony is the, a founding member and president of the International Association for Assistance Dog Partners. This organization has been around for a, quite a while, at least what, uh, almost 30 years now? 92. 92, woohoo, okay. Uh, and 
Tony is also, she tells me this, so we'll see. Um, how long have you, Tony has been using guide dogs for 55 years. Anybody, anybody else any longer? All right, you got it. <laughs> yay, yay. So uh, there are apparently a few of us 40 year and 30 year people out there, but uh, not too many 50 year people. <laughs> yay. To Tony's left is Mr. Ed Crane, and Ed is a um, service dog handler. You may have seen Ed and his uh, large yellow lab here, who he's going to tell you what his dog does for him. He is also the, um, the operator of a website, myservicedog.org. No, I'm sorry, my service dog incorporated. There we go. So, and we will give you all of these in, in an email later, so never fear. To my right are two folks that I had the pleasure of meeting during the 2016 Regneg process for the Air Carrier Access Act. And they are Veronica Morris, who is the president of the Psychiatric Service Dog Partners and Brad Morris, who is the legislative director for PSDP. And Brad and I were the co-chairs of the uh, service dog working group for that particular effort. We then formed another organization that's a loose collaboration, but it's one that we advocate under called United Service, let me see if I can get this right, United Supporters and Advocates. See, I already screwed it up. <laughs> United Supporters, Advocates, and United Service Dogs. Uh, see, I'm going to yeah. give it to them because I'm losing <laughs> my mind right now. Okay, do it. <laughs> Here, I'm a friend to it. Oh, good grief. Okay, Jesus. pay attention to the letters. Yes. United Service Animal Users, Supporters, and Advocates. Thank you. Because USA. Exactly. Who can be against USA? USA. Right. <laughs> <laughs> So, now that I have given those auspicious introductions, I'm just going to give you a really quick thing here on how I got into the sort of the cross the holistic service animal advocacy. Um, I realized back in the early 90s, um, as Tony did as well in forming IAADP, that this law covers all of us. It's not a special law for guide dog people up here. <laughs> and all you other people down here, we are all fighting the same battles now. We're fighting the battles against people who, for whatever reason, want to usurp the law and get around it. People who d either don't know, don't understand, or choose not to abide by behavior standards. And then the business community that really doesn't understand that they have the right to say, no, you need to take that dog out. And so we're all fighting the same battle. And this is a tough battle to fight, folks, because you know we all hate people who are taking away our rights and making things more difficult for us. Sometimes, though, it's really hard to figure out who those people are. So I am going to turn this over, and, and I, I love having an, a Tony and Ed up here again. Um, <laughs> just, they, they are not. No, there's not. The, there's no connection there. They are just friends. Um, <laughs> I had to put that out there, but I'm going to turn the mic over to Tony to give us a little history and then Ed to talk a little bit about what his dog does and what his history is for our first 15 minutes so you all know what's going to happen. And then Brad and Veronica. Veronica is going to talk a bit about Hestia, who some of you have had a chance to meet. And then Brad is going to talk a little bit about legislation and legislative history and efforts. So here you go, Tony. I was one of these kids who loved dogs, and my mother could not ever convince me that it was an unfriendly dog I should have pet. So when I got my guide dog, I got, and that was in 1967, and I used to think when I was younger, wow, there are some people who had dogs for over 50 years, and I thought I was much younger then, and um, now I'm one of them. But I loved the idea of guide dogs, and it changed my life thoroughly. And so I got involved with a number of the guide dog schools and got to know a lot of the CEOs at the time. And when I met my late husband in 84, he was writing a book called um, A Guide to Guide Dog Schools. And he didn't know that much about guide dogs. He really didn't. When he had gotten his dog at Seeing Eye, he knew so little. He had never had a pet dog. And when his dog one time 
lifted his leg and peed on him during the walk. Um, his trainer came running over and said, Dr. Ames, that's a bonding sign, the dog showing you. I said, no, that's a sign of a bad dog who peed on you. <laughs> but we started to learn about people with other disabilities and their dogs, and it was so fascinating. You know, we were so entrenched in the guide dog movement and all the things that, that, excuse me, that guide dogs could do for you. But we were at a conference with the Delta Society, and we met people in wheelchairs who dog, whose dogs could retrieve things for them, uh, dogs who could push buttons on a phone to call 911, and we said, we have so much in common. Our veterinary issues are in common. We all have canines, and they all have different kinds of problems. We all have the problem of retirement, or euthanasia, or how does the family who's not disabled accept your dog? So in 1992, we established the International Association of Assistance Dog Partners, and you can get that online, iaadp.org. And we advocate for all people with well-trained, and that is a big thing, well-trained <laughs> dogs. And just recently, before I came here, I was reading an email from the Assistance Dog Club of Puget Sound. It's a great club, and they get together, and they go on trips, they work with people who are training their own dogs, and dogs do not have to come from any kind of organization. The big thing all the time is they have to be well trained. You can't just say, I love Fido, and I just can't bear to leave the house without Fido. Um, the dog has to be trained to do something for you. And Gene Hample, their former president, came up with a list, and I think it's, it's very good, because there are so many, I'm sure all of you have met, the phonies out there. And you can tell by the behavior of the dog that they're phonies. So Jean came up with a list of people who have uh, no right to be going into public. And the first of the list is a non-disabled person with maybe a well-trained dog or not, but they got the vest online. So they claim they have a service dog. And then you have the non-disabled person with a well-behaved dog, but it's not their dog. It could be you know, a family member's dog, and they still want to have public access. And then you have a disabled person with a pet, maybe well-trained or not well-trained, but the dog has no task training. Or uh, the non-disabled person um, or I should say a disabled person with a poorly <coughs> behaved service dog. And these are some of her issues about what constitutes you know, a dog who should not have public access. I was going to a physical therapist in my hometown of Fresno, and my physical therapist had a little chihuahua, and when I would come in with my golden retriever guide dog, this dog would bark and bark, and they had to put him in a separate room. And then I found out that George took his dog everywhere. He said, I love my dog. I don't want to leave my dog alone. I take him to restaurants and so on. And I said to him, well, it's illegal. He said, well, I have a vest. I said, that's still illegal. <laughs> Your dog doesn't have to wear a vest or a harness or any other equipment. And I said, okay, what would happen, George, if I came into a restaurant and um, I forgot the dog's name, we'll call him Fido, you know, starts barking at Adora the way he does when I come into the physical therapy practice. And he joked with me and he said, well, then I tell you, you should go to another restaurant. But it is unfortunate how many people out there love their dogs very, very much but should not be bringing their dogs in public. First of all, what nobody seems to be addressing is that some of those dogs are terribly, terribly yes. stressed. Yes. You might love your dog, but the dog might not love to be on an airplane and might not love to be in a crowd. I mean, it's a phenomenal when you think about all the dogs we have here. And, you know, we have an occasional bark, but there's no fighting, there's no 
growling, and people are going by and saying, stick to your right or do this, you know. I think it's so incredible how many dogs there are here and how wonderfully trained they are. Um, and then you hear about flight attendants who get bitten and, and all this kind of stuff, and that's why the airlines are coming up with all these rules that affect all of us. And of course, what they want is a certification process. Well, it doesn't work. Who's going to certify us? You know, are these going to be trained people who evaluate the behavior of your dog? You get a tag, you get a vest, you get whatever. I was in a store in Florida, and the cashier was commenting about my dog. Oh, she's so quiet. She's so well behaved. And I'm sort of shocked. I said, that's the way she's supposed to be. And she's telling me about all these other dogs over the months who have growled at other customers, who have been very poorly behaved. And I said, you don't have to allow them in here. She said, I know, but management doesn't want negative publicity. And that's one of the things we all have to get together and do is educate the public out there that they don't have to accept poorly behaved dogs. They don't have to let them into their stores or theaters. There's one case I read recently of a dog who barked throughout a theatrical production. At the second bark, I would have said, bye, out with you. You know, uh, how disturbing to the rest of the public who then gets annoyed with dogs. We don't want dogs in here. Not realizing that we have various types of dogs. So we need to not get mad at the fakers, but get mad at the people who won't prosecute the fakers, who won't say, no, I'm sorry, you can't leave, and if it's negative publicity, so be it, and talk, why, why did you not let this dog in here? Well, the dog is growling or barking or, you know, not housebroken, or all the other things that they accuse all dogs of doing. Uh, so we need that. There's no, you know, you hear the word service dog, and then you hear the word fake, and they don't yeah. go together. There are fakers, and those are the people who try to get dogs into places. Now, I adore my cat, and he loves me, so I joke, can I call him an emotional support cat and take him with me? I also personally think that any therapist who signs a form saying that you definitely need Fluffy with you because you can't fly or you can't go to the store, and they've never met Fluffy, they have no idea, of the behavior of this dog, um, they should be prosecuted too if they sign those forms. So there has to be a lot more negative publicity, not all these little ads about how wonderful dogs are and they do so much for us. I think that's, that's great, but there are also people who shouldn't have dogs with them. So I could go on forever, but I'm gonna turn this over to Ed. And Ed has a wonderfully behaved dog. You know, one more thing, when I've, when I've when people have asked to meet me and they say they have a service dog, I'm very suspicious. I'm like, yeah, we'll see. Ed's <laughs> dog will not even pick up, you know, a french fry fell off the table. And uh, he said, my dog won't take it. I said, my dog will, you know. <laughs> but, you know, some of these dogs have behaviors that are even better than our guide dogs. So here we go. Thank you, Tony. Hi, my name is Ed Crane, and I'm happy to, very proud to uh, attend this event. Uh, I happen to be an individual who's 62 years old, and at age 30, <coughs> I experienced my first grand mal seizure. And in a short period of time, seizures took control of my life, and I became epileptic. And uh, over the years, I was still able to function and do things, but I went from having just one or two seizures a week to a point now where I can have 10 or 20 a day, depending on the day. And I, I was able to work. I worked in the World Trade Center in New York for uh, 24 years. And uh, finally, I was falling and injuring. And of course, on the way down, there was always a desk or a table or a chair or something that cut the head or broke a bone, had so many broken bones. But luckily, I had at least partial surgery on my left temporal lobe 
And the goal of that was just to bring down the frequency, and that helped me. But I was introduced to the concept of a service dog shortly after that. And my partner here today is my third dog in the past 17 years. His name is Zern. And the beauty of what these dogs are able to do is for epilepsy, and I'm shaking folks, but that's, that's part of who I am and what I do. Um, he is trained in a very simple way. I provide the organization an undershirt that I was wearing when I had a seizure. And for six months, they trained Zern and my previous two dogs to be able to pick out that scent with 100% accuracy. And then, from that point on, I get, a, I get a warning from my partner about 30 minutes before I experience a seizure. And what he has been trained to do is, Zern has been trained that whenever that scent comes up, he'll come over and rub his head on my knees. And he's expecting me to lay on the floor or wherever I am outside. So if I don't lay down quick enough, he'll then start to bump me, saying, hey, Ed, I gave you the warning, I want you to lay down. And once I lay down, he will take his front legs and put them over my feet down there, and he'll stay there until the seizure is over. Now, when I start to come out of a seizure, of course, I think it's over myself, but it isn't. He will get off automatically when he can tell me it's over. And then he'll come over and give me a little lick on the side of the face, and that's, that's my, my service, uh, and he is able then to tell me it's time, time to get up and get into a chair. I also have balance issues, and I've had a number of people come up to me. He's wearing a specially fitted harness on his back that rises up to my arm and hand length. It's fitted to me and I am always attached to him except like right now I'm leaning leaning up here. But that prevents me from falling and injuring myself. And I can tell you in 17 years for three dogs, the only time I had injuries was in between partnerships yeah. when I didn't have a dog <laughs> along the way. So what these dogs are able to do and the concept that works for him works the same way with diabetes. Dogs are trained to a scent that the body emits even before we as the individual begin to feel it or experience it. And the difference that makes provides us independence again. Independence. And let me just step a little bit away from that. I've been partnered for so long, five years ago, one thing I found was there's tremendous amount of information out there on the internet and the world around us with respect to all the topics that come up with these amazing dogs, whether it's information about dog food or recalls or veterinary care, um, information about uh, legal issues in any state or region, or if you are all of a sudden faced with discrimination, how to move forward. Uh, I formed a nonprofit company five years ago called My Assistance Dog Incorporated, and we are nothing more than a, a resource of information. And to give you an idea, one of the things I put together a while ago is a plastic card that looks like a credit card. And on here is nothing more than the Department of Justice law regarding service dogs. Okay, so that if I go in and I'm somebody who uh, everybody thinks is training a dog, so and I'm in the state of California, which is enforces the laws very well, but uh, in many states it's good to have this in case you run into a situation where you're denied access or there is a problem. Here are the details of of that law, and just about two weeks ago, before I came out, I happened to go to a location to uh, um, see a live show, and on entry, I was refused entry. Oh. And of course, I had the individual get management out, and I had to educate management along the way. But I provided this card, and I also was not afraid to file a complaint 
uh, online, I have as a resource on my website, one of the resources, um, ways to very quickly file a complaint. Um, I did it on a national basis and in the state of California, I filed it with the state and the state will follow up on that within three or four weeks and I have a funny feeling he'll be fined $250 to $2,500 and that will teach, teach a lesson. In California, it's very, very good. There's tremendous support for not only the disabled community but assistance dog community, but in many states there isn't. I have these cards and I'd be happy to give anyone one of these cards. It, it feels like a credit card, it's plastic, but it's exactly laid out off the federal website. So, uh, um, And I have other information here, I'm not going to take up a lot of time, but we, we on our website put up information uh, and stories. Here's, here's a story about seizure alert dogs, seizure response dogs, um, is, is a is an assistance dog right for you? Um, here's one I happened to a long time ago got involved with uh, the tax deduction of my dog. So we printed information on, on the website about the federal deduction and how the process works, what's involved, will you qualify. We put a website and an information site together that's a resource anything from veterinary care to how to file a complaint to just information about the dogs. And uh, we now have a following around the world of a few hundred thousand people. And, uh, what is the name of the website? My Assistance Dog Incorporated. That's, it, it all comes down to the name of the organization. And uh, matter of fact, just from last night to this morning, uh, I had 400 emails. So, uh, you know, that's my assistance dog incorporated, uh, dot com. Or if you just put my assistance dog incorporated on there, it'll, it'll show a couple of dozen times because of the number of postings we have. So, I appreciate coming out here and, and, and any way I can be helpful, or I'm just proud to be able to share the story of the dog that and the three dogs that have helped me in my life, service dogs. So, thank you very much. And of course, this is Tony again. I'm no fool. He's on the IADP board now. <laughs> <laughs> All right, here you Can go. Can I ask now. a question? Uh, no, we no, will no. be we'll doing. Yeah, we'll yeah, we'll be doing questions okay. at the end. All right, Ready? thank you. So, hi, I'm Veronica Morris, and this is my service dog, Hestia. Uh, she is a small eight pound uh, Japanese chin. What that means is she's a black and white dog. She's mostly white. She has black ears and black fur over one of her eyes. And she's got big googly eyes and a really smushed nose so that her head is pretty much the shape of a racquetball. If you would, if you would like to, to feel her, uh, then seek me out after this presentation. I'm happy to let you experience what it's like having a dog that looks this funny. Or cute. <laughs> My dad calls her ugly. But <laughs> She's adorable. So I, I started out um, getting a dog in a slightly different way. Um, I, was, I have bipolar disorder, post-traumatic stress disorder, and agoraphobia, which basically means uh, I have a very difficult time leaving my house, uh, and I have <coughs> mood swings up to like highs where I think I can fly and things like that, down to lows where I try to kill myself, and I have a lot of uh, anxiety related to the situations that uh, I had for post-traumatic stress disorder. So my therapist, when I was living in Chapel Hill doing my uh, master's, um, she said to me, you need to do a volunteer job. And I said, well, I'll volunteer at the dog shelter. I'll walk the dogs. And I didn't want a dog of my own. I just wanted to, you know, hang around dogs. And this one dog uh, was just very special. All the other dogs, you would take them out, and they would chase squirrels and bark and, you know, all that kind of stuff. Well, this dog, Sabrina, she was a Weimarner pit bull mix, and she would come out and just sit on my feet and look up at me and just want loving. And um, it came time for her to be put down, and I couldn't, I couldn't handle that. So without really meaning to have a dog, I adopted a dog. Oh. She was naturally alerting to my mood swings and panic attacks, uh, and I reinforced that training to make it so that she, she did it reliably. 
Uh, and I first I didn't even know that was something that a service dog could do. I just thought it was a neat trick that my pet could do. Until several years later, I was at Berkeley getting my PhD and uh, I experienced very difficult times with my medications and my, my therapist and psychiatrist recommended that I train my dog as a psychiatric service dog, so I did. Um, and I'm on my third dog now, and I will tell you the, the way I've trained them to alert me to my anxiety attacks and mood swings, well actually just anxiety attacks now because I have the mood swings covered with medication, um, is every time I get anxious, I call them over and give them lots of really, really good treats. So they start associating me being anxious with like lots of fun and great stuff. Sometimes I use a, a special toy that I keep just for this occasion. Um, and so I would call them over and they would say, oh, mom's anxious, that's great. On their own, they would start coming over when I got anxious and I would reward heavily. Uh, and then I would work with the dog to find a behavior that they liked to use to alert me to my anxiety levels. Um, because I found just the simple process of calling them over and giving them a treat when I was anxious was enough for them to start picking up on something. We don't know what it is. It could be a smell, it could be my heart rate, it could be my breath. Um, so the, the dog would come over and offer a behavior. And so my first service dog, her offered behavior was sitting in front of me and looking at me, which was fine. My second service dog, a silver standard poodle named Ollivander, uh, he, yeah, he was gorgeous. Um, he started alerting me by barking, which was really not cool, and made me very embarrassed and have panic attacks even more. So I had to train him, I had to train him out of the barking, and the, key, the cue that he used was nudging my hand with his nose. And then <clears throat> with my current dog, Hestia, the behavior she offered was licking my arm, and, uh, and that works fine for me. Unfortunately, she's only able to alert when she's close to my face. So uh, that is a little bit of a problem, but she does medical response from across the room. If I start actually going into a panic attack and she hasn't noticed to alert me, she runs over immediately as soon as one starts, jumps into my lap, and starts the deep pressure therapy and grounding behaviors that I've trained her to do when I am needing them. Um, and I wanted to share that there are all kinds of interesting things that psychiatric service dogs can do. The one that I find most amazing is hallucination discernment. I have a friend who has schizophrenia and um, she hallucinates people in, that are in rooms and usually she hallucinates people that have knives or scary things happening with them, threatening people. Um, so she trained her dog, when her dog walks in the room, her dog looks at each person in the room, one by one, just indicating with their head, there's a person, there's a person, there's a person. Um, and then that way she knows, okay, the guy that I see in the corner with a knife is just a hallucination. It's not, it's not a real person over there threatening me. And she's used this for years now. She's on her second service dog. And it's just amazing to watch the dog allow her to the independence and freedom to travel and explore and make friends and go out in public without having to worry about her hallucinations. So I just want to uh, conclude with one more thing, a little quick story about how we're all in this together. I used to live in Berkeley, California, and when I lived in Berkeley, I was not using Hestia, I was using my first two dogs, the Weinreiner Pitbull Mix and the Standard Poodle, and there were a lot of other dogs. I saw a service dog, excluding my friends that had service dogs, I saw a service dog about every day that I went into campus. Um, and so I noticed that a lot of the dogs were trying to attack my dogs. Um, and so I could, kept a kind of like count in my head about who was doing the attacking and what the situations were and what gear the dogs were carrying, wearing, that is. And I found that it was equal. There were just the same number of guide dogs attacking my service dog as there were owner trained dogs, seizure dogs, psychiatric service dogs. It was all the same. So we don't, we don't really have any reason to be treating each other differently. If we all experience the same things, we hate it when people uh, are, are fakers as well. It really, it, 
just horrible for us because at least, you know, we, we don't look dis disabled at all. <coughs> And so we go into a store and they say, oh, the last of dog that was in here pooped on the floor. <coughs> so you can't come in here. And, um, and, and that really is, if you can imagine how hard that would be when you have an anxiety disorder and <coughs> talking with people makes you anxious, it's very difficult. So I will, I've probably talked too long and I'm gonna hand it over to Brad now. All right, speaking of looking disabled, if you were able to see me, if you are able to see me, you'll note that I'm the guy in the wheelchair. So that's why I've been Brad in the wheelchair at this conference. Normally I'm Brad with a beard. Uh, but you know, you gotta watch your toes and paws around me. <laughs> so so uh, I want to spend a little bit of time, and, uh, and I do mean a little bit, to riff on what's been said here and what Tim Hornick was saying beautifully during the previous session that Paul was mentioning too. Uh, he was talking about sharing within the community and I think a bit beyond the community and that's exactly what we're here for is to open up collaborations and discussions. So to do that I thought I would talk a, a little bit about the lessons that I hope we can learn from the history of the Americans with Disabilities Act and the 2016 Air Carrier Access Act <laughs> negotiations that Janine and I were involved with. So there's a great article I highly recommend on the ADA, the, the history behind the ADA getting passed by Arlene Mayerson. And it's on the Disability Rights Education and Defense Fund site, that's DREDF.org. Um, and please come up and get my Braille business card afterward Yay. if you want me to email that link to you because it's really worthwhile. So the history stretches back at least to Section 504 of the Rehab Act back in 1973. That's when things really started to turn around with the laws in the U.S. So the next couple of decades <coughs> leading up to the passage of the ADA uh, required that disability groups joined forces to fight for regulations and enforcement from the executive branch, to fight against legal challenges from businesses through the judicial branch, and to fight for broader and effective protections from the legislative branch when lawmakers wanted to divide the community. And this will get exciting soon, I promise. It's very the, so the lesson then and now is that standing together in solidarity, or for me sitting, is necessary to both gain and protect our rights. In case you don't believe me that this is not just a thing of the past, even now legislators and business lobbies are actively pushing to undo ADA protections. I'm seeing some head nods. Some of you pay attention to news at all and you know about this sort of thing. So the most recent session of Congress last year, the House actually passed H.R. 620. And if you know about this stuff, you'll know just how horrible it is. This would gut the ADA. I'm, I'm seeing some, some thumbs down raised up back there. Um, but fortunately, good news, the Senate didn't pass it. They, they had better things to do with their time, I guess. But this has come up every year for the past few years. So this is something that should really concern us and that we need to actively fight against. So fast forward to the Air Carrier Access Act or ACA negotiations in 2016. The Department of Transportation or DOT, as Janine said, um, they picked us. We got to represent service animal users and programs uh, to help update the flying laws and we certainly did our best. <laughs> but we saw Arlene Mayerson's lessons repeated firsthand. It's hard to get what you need for your own piece of the disability community without solidarity and cross-community understanding that underpins that solidarity. So again, that's why we're here for that kind of understanding. So just one quick point to broaden the understanding, um, I think needs more of it, is distinguishing ESAs from psychiatric service dogs. This affects what makes sense for access. So if we don't understand what they are, we can't understand what the access rights should be and whether they should differ. So both are for disabilities. A lot of people don't even know that. You're supposed to have a disability for each. But ESAs typically are just pets that help by being there, which is great. While psychiatric service dogs are another kind of service dog, so they're a non-guide service dog, 
Um, so they have to be trained to help and are way more likely to behave in no pets places. All right, so to, to wrap this up for, for my part, most importantly, we need to have the big and small conversations like we're, we've been trying to do here with all of y'all so we can understand each other and ultimately come together on big issues. Treating each other as decent humans is the foundation to being stronger together and getting rid of all the misconceptions and infighting that ends up hurting our community and helping its detractors. So since I don't want to just talk at you, but I believe we need to encourage dialogue, any remaining time that I may have had, uh, I'll give over to extra Q &A. Can I say something real quick? Yeah, Veronica has something important to note. I just wanted you guys to note, I, uh, a lot of you might have, if you have vision, uh, noticed that while Brad was speaking, uh, my dog got up on my chest and started licking my face. I was having a panic attack. Um, and so that's what it looks like when someone is using their service dog um, for psychiatric re reasons. It can look all kinds of different ways. It can look like she's not doing anything here. She's licking my hand again, saying, you're starting to get more anxious. You better calm down. Um, so it, I just wanted to give you a sense of that's what it looks like when she's working. It looks like she's being a cute dog licking me, but actually she's enabling me to not run out of this room screaming. <laughs> so. Alrighty, folks. Well, um, I promised we'd get to the apparel. Uh, the green scarf, Brad also has on a green scarf. And I'm gonna and, and we're gonna be introducing this concept to Tony and Ed over here. But let the well before we get to the questions, uh, while we're running fishing out another mic from somewhere for someone to run to you guys for your questions. Second mic, isn't it up there? Oh, it's behind. John uh, has it uh, back here. Okay, super. So um, sighted so. mic runner, if you want somebody up here, I would oh, like to grab that guy. And know. then I will send uh, you. Actually, Brad, you can probably use that one if we don't get too much feedback to talk about the uh, the dreaded uh, green scarf. It's not dreaded. dreaded. <laughs> well, it'll be dreaded to our enemies because, folks, the same people that brought about House Bill 620 are the same people that fake service dogs and that it's the same concept that's going to undermine things. So it's, you know, it's the same taking advantage of the rights of people with disabilities to further their own whatever agenda. So um, there's my thing that you're going to go, oh, Janine, I can't believe you said that. <laughs> <laughs> All righty. So you, we often have visual um, representations these days, like the wristband, and everyone wearing the same T-shirt. So through the mic so we can record it. That might not be on. It's it says it's on. Hello. Yeah, here. Start again. Start again, Brad, because we want to make sure it's on the record. I'll give you that. All right. So, just like wristbands and everyone wearing the same shirt. What? <laughs> okay, I'll hold it farther away. <laughs> we, we are trying to start something like that that is distinctive for the broader service dog community and the tentative working name, since this is new, is Solidarity Scarves. And so these are green scarves that we can use to show our support in solidarity with one another. And this is another one of those things where if you want info on where to get these things, I worked at a, I worked at a deal with, uh, with someone to sell them at basically the um, price that they get them for in China. So, so yeah, let me know. Again, I've got a box of business cards. I'd have to be very, very happy to be in touch with any of you about any of this. Just like um, oh, the, the email, uh, we, we're trying to facilitate local meetups all across the country as well. So if you'd like to be involved in that in the ground up, give me your contact info and we'll try to get people together with different kinds of service dogs so we can have just everyday conversations over a meal or bowling or whatever you like to do. All right. Okay. Now we'll, see, we'll make sure that mic works. Okay, now there was a lady over here to my right uh, who had a question. So if I remember, right, hopefully that mic will work. If it doesn't, oh Janine, you'll have to repeat the question. If it doesn't, I question. will repeat the question. Very good. <laughs> Penny. Yes. Yes. Penny. Hey, Janine, it's Penny. And hi, hey. Brad and Veronica. Hi, Penny. Um, I'm wondering if um, I'm very happy to talk to my board to see if GDY would like to participate in your uh, project. Um, do you think that would be possible? And we make the scars available via the GDY website as well? Yes. <laughs> yes. I'm looking at Brad. Brad's looking at me. I'm looking at Brad. Brad's looking at me. I'm like, 
Hey, why not? <laughs> all right. Well, I think that would be great, but you know what I need from you, Brad, or Janine, or all of us, <laughs> is for you to uh, write us an article about it so we can educate our members if we decide to do it, and I'm pretty sure we will. I think we um, can probably do and that. We would really, uh, I think that's a great idea. I think we all need to demonstrate that we stand for one another, and one another stands for us, and I think that's exactly the way to do it. And I have one more thing to say. It's freezing in here. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so anyway, yeah. It's in the back there. Already. We have someone on that. So we have one vote for freezing, um, warming one's feet. Mm -hmm. Warming one's feet may end up being a task. Um, Trainable and reinforceable. We've got someone with a question. Uh, and we have a question. I have a question. This is Nancy Younger. This is addressed to Ed Crane. What's the difference between the picture that my school gives me when I graduate? And the card you have, you know, is it the same thing basically? Or, um, I don't understand what your card has on it. Uh, Thank you. My my card is is not an ID. We'll give you the mic. Okay. We'll give you the mic. There you go. The card I have is not an ID at all. It is just the federal law uh, laid out on a plastic card that makes it easy when when handed to somebody who um, is not aware that they're breaking the law. Um, I've used it a number of times. A couple of times I thought it was important enough to leave behind. That's why I printed so many of them. Um, but it makes it easy because even, even myself, when somebody wants to understand the law, myself with my epilepsy, um, sometimes all of a sudden I can't explain it in a clear fashion. When I put this card out in front of me, it is written exactly the way it is on the website. The logo's there. It's the same wording, everything. So that's why I found these cards just very helpful. I have a question. Okay. Is the Thank you. Okay. Um, first of all, I want to say that I have gone from skeptic. This is Debbie Phillips. Um, I have gone from skeptic to um, being a believer, and today has been a giant step in that process. So, um, I would, my question is, the, the uh, <clears throat> bus company in my town has made this decision that uh, whether a dog is well behaved or not, if the person getting on the bus says, yes to yes it's a service dog they can get on the bus they might growl at my dog or bark incessantly but the, but they will not kick them off and they will basically if i say something say well the company says we can't say anything my response has been i can and i have <laughs> um and i've asked people you know is this a service dog? And I've even said, what task does this dog do to mitigate your disability? And um, have gotten some hostility. Yes. Is it better for me to leave it alone since the bus company is not gonna do anything? Or is it better for me to um, ask the questions that I've asked? I'll, I'll give you my experience first. This is Ed Crane. A long time ago, I realized that it was easier to walk away and let something go without management being uh, held to fruition for it. But I've learned that um, what I do now, because I've set the system up so easy, is I just happen to have an instance of refusal to an event recently. And what was simple for me to do was I filed a federal complaint, which I know will do nothing but be a statistic. Uh, but I filed a complaint with the Attorney General in the state of California. And I have set it up on my website where everywhere a complaint could be filed could be done very easily in a few seconds. And I know that the Attorney General will eventually either send them a fine of a few hundred dollars or some upwards of a 2,500. But I took it a step further. What works for me, 
I got the name of the manager, management of the company, and I wrote a letter. I've got a form letter written already, and I sent it to management just before I, I left, and I have no doubt now that management will get back to me and they will train their employees going down. And the only reason I took these steps was I don't want the person behind me, the next person coming in with the dog, to experience what I did. And if I didn't take action, that's exactly what would happen. So let I'm me let me pass the, let yeah. me pass the microphone down. So I think we're gonna we're gonna do the whole yeah we're gonna do the entire panel up here, folks, because I think we all have an answer oh, to this. Yeah. No, I wanted to give it to Janine. Okay, okay. go ahead, Janine. I'll right. after you. Oh, no sure. worries, no worries. So you have a couple options here, Debbie. Um, probably the option because I used to work in transit, so I can tell you. Um, go to the board of directors. Write a letter. Yeah. Take some yes. videos with your phone. It's real easy, folks. You ask your magic assistant on your phone, hey, S lady, um, record video. <laughs> and she'll pop you right into your camera program. The record button's right above the home button. You double tap. This is iPhone. I'm sorry, Android people. <laughs> there is an app called Blindfold Video. And when you say, hey, S lady, open Blindfold Video, that app will automatically open with your video camera on. And the video today is what what we have to use because it's our word versus theirs, and we don't see, so we didn't see. Um, but I would write a letter and to the, the the board of your transit agency and uh, send a copy to the media, send a copy to Ed, send a copy to Tony, send a copy to Brad and, and Veronica. I mean, copy yeah, send a copy to Penny. I mean, CC it with national organizations. Yeah so that they realize there's an issue. And I'm going to send it over to Veronica. I'm not going to touch on the legalities, because that's already been touched on. But um, I, you, those who've met me know I tend to be a pretty friendly, nice person. And I don't like getting in confrontations with people. So when I see a dog that is not behaving appropriately as a service dog, I approach them and I ask if they need any help. Do you need any help training your dog? Maybe we could meet up and I could show you how a service dog is supposed to behave. You know, things like that. Not so those I, words. And not those words, <laughs> yes. <laughs> Sometimes <laughs> But so, so my method is, in addition to the legal options following up with a company, my method to end the problems of ill-behaved dogs being claimed as service dogs is to try to educate those people as much as possible. Brad, did you want to say something? Yeah, one more thing I learned from talking with a bunch of um, executives and people with power uh, for the airline industry is part of the problem is that they have no idea what your experience is like. They have no idea that if your dog gets attacked, you could lose your independence for years. That happened to me. That happened to Veronica. And so it, it's, if you treat them like they're decent human beings who are just ignorant and you can set up a meeting with them, you might make a lot of progress, at, at, much more than if you assume that everyone was out to get you and had ill will, because most people are not like that. All righty, next question. Next, next question. Anyone? Question? I think we're running up. Are we running? Yes, we, I'm sorry, we're running into the puppy folks. So. I want to, um, unless somebody's got something pressing, we're going to probably go out in the lobby where it'll be a little easier for everybody to, um, or out in the hallway here to talk to us. And um, again, we are all here for you, um, and we want to hear your questions and concerns, etc. cetera. Um, thank you so much, Debbie and uh, Top Dog folks, for letting us do this panel. Thank, thank you. you. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Audio recording and photography, Bradley W. Morris, M.A. Seafill, January 19, 2019. Top Dog Guide Dog Conference, Charleston, South Carolina. Videography and production, Bradley W. Morris. Narration, Veronica Morris, Ph.D. Copyright 2019, Psychiatric Service Dog Partners. Music, Berkus Puhana, performed by Bien Sur.